Aloha and welcome to Ehana Kako. We're here every week on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kili'i Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute. We live in such a beautiful land, Hawaii, beautiful skies, scenery everywhere, lovely people. Why would anyone want to leave Hawaii? <laughs> We're going to find out about that a little bit today. I've got a delightful and very interesting guest who represents or is at the cutting edge of a generation of young people who are reshaping the way we think about education and career and designing one's life. You'll meet her in just a moment, but I want to say welcome to the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Every week we broadcast up to 30 to 35 hours of original content from Honolulu and it goes across the world and so does my guest today. My guest is Ken Lee Skulland. Ken Lee Skulland, whom some of you may know as the daughter of Ken and Lee Skulland, uh, educators living here in the state of Hawaii, but uh, raising their daughter across the world. Now she has... I don't say this in any condescending way. She's grown up <laughs> and, and is making her future path. And I'm delighted that she's my guest today. And she'll share some of her insights on how education is changing for the next generation, the millennials. Ken Lee, welcome to the program. Thank you very much for having me. So glad to have you here today. In fact, uh, you're visiting just for a short period. Uh, I'll tell our viewers that you live in Santiago, Chile. So why is it that you make that your domicile? <laughs> Yeah, I initially moved down to Chile to work for a company called Sovereign Men, who helps, uh, which helps people internationalize themselves abroad. And the founder chose Chile specifically because it's one of the easiest places to get residency. Um, well, that phrase, Sovereign Man, yeah. kind of reveals a little bit of your own philosophy, I think, about where sovereignty really resides. Yeah, it uh, was my belief was very in line with this company's message that helped people uh, plant multiple flags around the world and internationalize themselves and their assets for greater um, safety and prosperity. Just briefly, what does that term internationalize mean? It doesn't mean visiting Paris and sitting in a cafe <laughs> and then coming home. It, it means something quite specific to you. Yeah, internationalization is well, one, one way of putting it is to plant multiple flags around the world. You can uh, be a resident in one place, you keep your assets in another place, you have property in another, businesses in another, and this helps you to protect yourself from uh, whatever may happen in one specific country, whether it be a financial crisis to uh, a political unrest or anything. And it can also help you take advantage of uh, greater opportunities that there may be across borders whether it be um, by providing your special knowledge or technology from your home country or being able to take advantage of the differences between them. With globalization taking place all across the globe yeah. <laughs> <laughs> today, do you think that our educational system here in this country adequately prepares people? Oh, for going abroad? Um, no. Well, not just going abroad, but living in this world that is so globalized. I think it really depends perhaps on what you study, mm -hmm. um, but for the most part I'd say no. I think um, from uh, the regular, this regular curriculum there's not, not much uh, that prepares you. Honestly, the only thing that does prepare you is actually going abroad, actually getting the experience of being in a different place, dealing with different cultures and people. Now, you've had a lot of time to think about the role of government in education, and, and I have to tell you that in my generation and for generations preceding me and even with my children, most Americans have thought of the state, the government, as the entity to play the largest role in education. We have public schools, we have public funding for college, we have college loans, work study, and so forth. So government is pervades everything about education in our country. But you have some different ideas. Yeah, it didn't always, uh, it wasn't, it hasn't always been that way. Uh, initially, when the founding of the United States, people, parents were a lot more, took a lot more uh, control and uh, in initiative in their children's education. Many children were, most children were homeschooled or they were taught through apprenticeships where they learn from a specific master to learn a specific skill. Um, but a lot changed um, 
in the 1850s as uh, the rise of, with the rise of migration. And all of a sudden, people started to think, maybe it would be better if we had standardized education so that we can kind of protect American democracy from these different viewpoints, these different religions specifically, and different cultures. Well, that sounds more like a tool for the state as opposed to actually providing education. And, and what you pointed out is that the, the, the founders of our country w would have been aghast at the idea that you'd hand your children over to the state to, edu to be educated. Yeah, very much so. The whole purpose was actually to, to limit um, the variety in ways of thought and to create a standardized government uh, controlled system, which goes against what most people think of when they think of America's founding um, principles. Now, you're an economist by training. You have an undergraduate degree and a master's degree from the London School of Economics. Mm -hmm. So you've taken an economic point of view in looking at education. Tell mm -hmm. us a bit about that. Yeah, I can't help it. Growing up in a family <laughs> of economists, it's it's how I've been taught to view life. Um, and so when I, I chose economics initially, I didn't choose it because of a career plan or anything. I'll, I'll be honest there. It was just because I thought that's how we viewed life. I thought that's how the you best. You talked about it at the dinner table. <laughs> yes, all and the time. <laughs> gatherings in your home and so forth, salons that your parents put on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when you use an economic analysis to look at the whole system of education, what are some of the things you see about the problem of government-driven education? Yeah, the biggest problem that we see today in, in education is, uh, is the fact that there's a huge, a tremendous bubble uh, with university degrees. And I trace this back to uh, the significant amount of federal financing for university. So when you say bubble, you're talking mm -hmm. about a huge supply of these degrees that, that, it, that is out there? But no, I actually that. mean the economic side of it, the, the, the debt that comes okay, with Okay, the financial yeah. bubble. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Financial bubble, just the same as the subprime um, mortgage crisis. This came from... Uh, a tremendous amount of money that a credit, easy credit given to people to buy their first home because it was thought as a nice thing that sure. everyone should own a home. And so we came to this problem that a lot of people who didn't necessarily have the income to support these payments uh, were purchasing homes and we saw how that turned out. So and it's kind of like the mm -hmm. subprime loan mm -hmm. crisis, but in the world of education, we have all of these people carrying huge amounts of debt. We, we hear about p graduate degrees that, that carry with them, if they're in medicine, for example, a massive amount of debt, law, and other areas, but just to get a, an undergraduate degree. Yeah. The uh, average is $35,000 in debt per student, but it can be far higher than that for many students who, given that, an av that many schools tuition for four years can be upwards of two hundred thousand dollars and this is this is debt that they all have to pay they have to pay off as soon as they graduate what has made it so enticing for people to walk into this kind of debt um, so it's a mixture of societal pressures this idea that you have to go to college to get a good job um, when I was graduating from high school I don't think anyone around me questioned whether or not we should go to college. It was the competition on which one to go and what, actually very few even questioned what to study. It was all about just getting going in. to college, getting in, and, and... And once you're in, taking whatever financing it, it was necessary in yeah. order to, to make it work. A lot of parents, uh, I mean, it, it was a, sort of a necessary struggle, necessary sacrifice because it's supposed to be an investment in our futures. And so no matter the cost, it's supposed to pay off uh, many times over in terms of the jobs that uh, will be available to you afterwards. The Would you say there's also been kind of a blind faith that if you get the degree... You'll get a job. <laughs> you'll get a job, you'll get a career. Yeah, but more... Like in 12th century Gaelic <laughs> literature. Yeah, exactly. But we're seeing um, a lot of issues with that. Number one, now we the, the millennial generation is known as the most educated generation yet. Because of such easy financing and such pressures, more students than ever are getting university degrees, which means 
means a tremendous amount of competition, increased competition for these the same amount of jobs, perhaps slightly more, but no, um, the increase in jobs has nowhere near matched the increase in number of college graduates. So the economy is not going forward as fast as the supply of degree carrying millennials is no. and, that, and that's creating a tremendous pressure. Mm -hmm. So w what have you seen as an alternative to this? Oh, yeah. before that, let me okay. ask you this question. Uh, I, I was interested in your analysis as we were talking about the quality of education affiliated with the government, either government-sponsored schools or government-funded education in private schools and so forth. Mm -hmm. You have some research that compares government sector schooling with private sector schooling. Um. Yes, well, my, my main research uh, previously when I lived in Hawaii was focused on um, uh, the school system prior to university, and I found huge discrepancies in Hawaii. Um, you would see that in Hawaii especially, we have one of the worst public school systems in the country, usually ranked between 46th and, 40, and 50th. Yeah, but when you say um, that, you also have to say, we love teachers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, but then the problem is that, and also, when you look at how much the state spends per student, oftentimes it's higher than private schools. Um, so it's not that it's actually a cheaper option, in, um, but the quality just doesn't match up to private schools. Even though many times they're paying more, the quality is often lower. And in my opinion, this comes from the fact that money equals power. And most people see this, everyone knows that phrase, and, but they see that as a reason why we want to um, not focus on business and whatnot. But I see it in a different way. Oh, because With money, power's bad. Yeah, that's what the, mo the, the mainstream thought on it is. But in my opinion, um, it's important to realize that money is power. And as a student, that means that if you pay for your education, you have power to decide on the curriculum and the teachers and things like that. You have a say in it. If you spend it in, at one school, that is, you have the power to s reward good schools and reward and sort of punish bad schools. On the other hand, with the public school system, when your money goes first to the government and then to the schools, it's actually the government that has power over the curriculum and the teachers and the whole system. And so by um, choosing this public school system where we pay the government taxes and they fund the schools, we're actually giving up that power to, um, to choose and encourage improvement in the school system. Now, you, you talk about power in a way that uh, in my generation, we, we, we didn't think of education. We, we thought of education as something that was given to us, provided to us, something we had to go through, mm -hmm. and we were recipients or consumers in the process. Mm -hmm. But this idea of conceiving of yourself as a power wielder, a power broker, uh, kind of flips the analysis a little yeah. bit. Yeah, I, when I think of it, I think of it as the power of the consumer. The person who is mm -hmm. consuming the education should have power over what is taught and what is, um, and who teaches. And I see that more and more um, online as people are able to choose online courses. They don't just sign up to choose. Uh, yeah, There's that's that the word. key <laughs> element there. Because I think in many ways, uh, when you talk about power, we disempower ourselves by giving away the power to choose, to choose the schools that our children go to and so forth. Mm -hmm. Well, when we come back from a quick break, could you suggest some alternatives? And in fact, tell us your alternative and the alternatives that many millennials are choosing today to being disempowered and instead gaining power in their education. Yeah. My guest is Ken Lee Scullant, a marketing consultant from Santiago, Chile, who in her heart, of course, is a resident of the islands here. And we'll be right back after the short message. I'm Kili'i Akina on Think Tech Hawaii's Ehana Kako. We'll be back after this short break. Hi, I'm Donna Blanchard. I'm the host of Center Stage here on Think Tech. On Center Stage, I talk with 
really amazing artistic guests about what they do, how they do it, and the most important point, why they do it. I think, I hope, the show is inspirational for everyone. I know it's always inspirational for me. I'm also the managing director of Kumukuhua Theater, which is right next door, and I happen to have with me now Will Kahele, who is an artist. We just finished a conversation. I hope you can catch on center stage. And we work together at Kumukuhua Theater. Why should people come over there? Because it's a great place to see uh, plays written by uh, local playwrights. Why should people watch this show? Oh, because um, because it's cool and it's uh, great things to know every week and because, you know, you are a very cool hostess. Oh, that's perfect. Thank you. Give me my money. <laughs> Give me my money. Welcome back to, again to Ehana Kako here every week on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. And I want to say thanks to the wonderful staff and crew who make Think Tech Hawaii work, especially Jay Fidel broadcasting from Honolulu, Hawaii. And you can find a wonderful library of programs on the economy, the government, uh, culture, the arts, uh, travel, almost anything under the sun at Think Tech Hawaii. Com. I'd also like to thank the Grassroot Institute for co-sponsoring this program uh, at the Grassroot Institute. We're committed to building a better economy, government, and society. And we like to say, e hana kako, let's work together. Because think of the terrible alternative if we don't work together. Nothing will get done. I know somebody who's working with a lot of people now, not only to advance her own career, but to advance their careers, Ken Lee Scullin, who has found an alternative pathway to getting an education it, that really prepares one to have a successful career. Kenley, we were talking about the fact that you've discovered that where government is involved in education, uh, whether it's in public universities or just by providing subsidies through loans and so forth, the quality of education is less than in the private sector where government really isn't involved. And that's a little deceptive too, though, isn't it? Because many private universities depend upon students who bring with them huge amounts of federal funding in order for them to survive uh, and even do better than survive in order to, for them to charge premium costs. Yeah, power and control over curriculum and uh, things doesn't just come directly from a government's laid out uh, curriculum, but it can also come through money and just if you if a school decides to go down a different path um, they may lose their accreditation and lose their ability to receive federal funding which is can be devastating which keeps keeps even private schools under check um, under the sort of the guidelines set by uh, government education boards. I hear a refrain coming from, from you frequently, power and control. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and not talking about power and control out there, not talking about the government having too much power con and control, but talking about yourself. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you're, you seem to be taking into your hands your life in a way that many are a little bit reluctant to do, changing your nation, changing your residency, uh, getting out of the system as much as possible. H how do students mm -hmm. who want to have good careers get out of the system now? What are some of the things th that they can do? Yeah, I, I think it's very important for everyone to take control of their own lives. Uh, actually, at the Sovereign Man offices, we had a great a uh, poster on the wall of Bruce Lee with the quote that said, uh, forget circumstances, I create opportunities. And I love that phrase, I love the concept. And I think all students today have this opportunity. Um, I, I think it's crucial not to just fall into the same trap as everyone else just because everyone else is taking on debt and doing this. It's it doesn't make sense <laughs> to do the same. So I see a lot of uh, alternatives. The first I'd recommend to students in high school that are considering university would be to take a gap year. That's um, something quite common in England where people decide to work or travel or do something else before applying to university. And I think that uh, is very crucial to help people um, to, to actually know what they want to do with their lives before they sign up to 
to invest so much in a certain uh, degree. I there, would, there used yeah. to be a stigma to a gap year. It, it, it looked like an omission on a resume, mm. uh, as if somebody had just taken off and partied and fooled around. And, and, and now, is that stigma changing? Yeah, very much so. I mean, it's it's all about what you can prove from it, I think. Um, yes, a lot of people do just sit on the beach in Thailand or something like that. Um, but if I, I advise people to take things seriously, not not school is not the only way to demonstrate your abilities and your quali qualifications, but also everything you do. So um, in today's world, it's better than ever and more important than ever to document what you do. If you you go and work on a specific product project to to document your experience there, maybe with a blog or maybe with um, writing an article afterwards and getting that published. There's a lot of things you can do um, to still to to be able to show something for what you've done with that time. Um, and I, I suggest going into that with a mission to to know that I'm specifically going to try out different. Um, careers or I'm going to try out this kind of lifestyle or try um, you know see what uh, I'm actually going to do with the rest of my life. Now um, uh, for you mm -hmm. it seems as though marketing yourself mm -hmm. and encouraging other Millennials to market themselves is actually part of the strategy of getting an education especially now with the, all of the digital tools. I think, yeah, marketing yourself is crucial. A lot of focus for students is to build your CV. And now I see the CV is not just a piece of paper that you supply, but it's also your online presence, actually. Um, the things you write, your articles or posts, all demonstrate what you've learned, your expertise, and um, this is crucial for anything you do down the line. Um, right now is the generation of authority building, and the way to get a job, the way to start a business, the way to sell something is through building your authority on certain topics. And so that's why I think it's very key to build up material documentation on your activities and um, your learning on certain subjects. And, and that may not be as hard as it, it, it sounds. Mm -hmm. it, it, could you just take things that are fun to do, things that you have an interest in doing, you know, volunteer work and so forth, and translate them into uh, a marketable self selling piece that, that, that shows what your worth is? Oh, for sure. I mean, it's all about showing what your priorities are, what um, yeah, your interests, your your network. If you're volunteering and helping, it's their commu community building. Um, yeah, but actually, to get back to your previous yes. question, I just want to make sure it doesn't get missed. Al different alternatives to school. So one is a, a gap year. Another one I'd suggest is to go abroad for your education. Um, I chose to go to England because. Um, in general, education, an undergraduate degree in England is only three years rather than four. So that's already one year less tuition and room and board. Um, and I even specifically chose a school where I could graduate in two years with a full degree. So it would be even cheaper. And a master's is one year. So I was able to get an undergraduate degree and a master's in the time that my um, high school classmates were still struggling through their undergrad. And while they were um, still trying to figure out what they were majoring in. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Even beyond that, um, there, there's some school, some countries that have very cheap education. There's some, another aspect is the fact that you could also learn a different language. If you went to China, for example, to do a degree, no one doubts that Chinese schools are focused on education, so you don't have to worry that it'll be um, very low quality. It will be a very low quality degree, and after the end of four years, you might also speak a language, another language, which would look great on your CV. A great way to differentiate differentiate yourself and to know that you've really used those four years well. Um, so gap year going abroad and also um, looking for other ways to prove yourself. Like I said, with um, building up your online presence in this, you can also pursue a number of online courses. There are, uh, through Coursera, you can take courses from the top universities in the world um, and pay simply for the certificate. You can take courses from MIT, who I guess your guest was from MIT last week. Um, all these things and pay just a couple hundred dollars maybe for the certificate versus a $46,000 
a year tuition um, bill. So you, there are many different ways to make uh, alternative, educated, and maybe more financially sound decisions um, when you're investing in your future career. Now, you've already shared with me a bit about how important it is to seek out mentorship in, in mm -hmm. different areas, and, and not in the traditional sense that you find this great mentor and, and sit at his or her feet, mm -hmm. uh, a guru, so to speak, but rather uh, to look at areas where you need skills and talents and experience, uh, mm -hmm. whatever those areas are, whether it's writing, photography, marketing, and so forth, and actually instead of paying tuition for a university, paying individuals yeah. to give you that education and give you that mentorship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this goes back to the traditional form of education in the, uh, like apprenticeship. You would find someone with mm -hmm. a specific skill or career that you wanted and you would just work with them. Um, today's world, there are different ways to do this. Um, when I was working at my previous job, I pursued the same concept. I really uh, valued the way that, uh, that Simon Black, the founder of Sovereign Man, was living his life. And so, as he always said, you should find someone who you like what they're doing and you try to make yourself invaluable to them. You offer them value. You, you try to, don't just say, oh, will you be my mentor? Will you take care of me? Will you give me education? Because someone who's busy and successful doesn't have time for that. But if you can provide them with value, um, they can accept you into their lives and you can learn firsthand what they do each day and how they run their businesses and things like that. Well, Ken Lee, this has been a fascinating conversation and our time is up too quickly. <laughs> but uh, I think you've got some valuable ideas that will help a great many people and I wish you the best on your, your career path. Thank you very much. For having me. Thank you. My guest today, Ken Lee Scullin, a marketing consultant who is changing the rules by which games are played. She's actually created her career uh, as part of her own educational out uh, her educational pr pathway and she's showing others uh, that there are new and different ways Millennials are choosing to tackle ca career direction and preparation I'm Kaylee Akina with the Grassroot Institute on Think Tech Hawaii's Ehana Kako until next week Aloha